Welcome everyone to today's presentation. So happy to see so many of you are interested in milkweed of all things. Got milkweed? Today's presentation is on that very plant. We'll look at some, well, no singing, uh, but stories that surround this genus, this milkweed genus that even many lay people, normal people who don't spend a lot of time studying plants have heard of, uh, perhaps because of its association with a particular insect. My name is James Stevenson. Uh, you can jot down my email address here if you have any questions, comments, or complaints or suggestions after today's presentation. Um, Jay Stevenson at PinellasCounty.org. I work for the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences through Pinellas County. So I'm a Pinellas County employee uh, doing the work of the University of Florida right here in Pinellas County, coming to you from Brooker Creek Preserve, 9,000 acres of natural Florida, where you can find the majority of our native milkweed species growing in their natural habitats. If you haven't discovered Brooker Creek Preserve, we certainly hope that you will um, very soon. The Extension Services, we are here uh, to provide research-based information to you, our citizens in our county, to help you make decisions. Uh, we don't tell you what to do, uh, but if you would like some advice on how to have a satisfying yard, garden, um, uh, we have the 4-H youth development, something to do for the kids. Uh, the UF IFAS extension is here for you for free, a resource right for you here in the county. Let's get started on today's presentation. And what, friends, is this a picture of? What is this a picture of? And no need to put any comments in the chat. I know you're all saying out loud, it's a picture of a butterfly. And that is perfectly understandable because assuming you are all humans watching and tuning into us today and understanding the words that I am saying, humans have a bias for animals. We tend to see animals before anything else. It has been a survival technique for our species ever since we've been a species to be able to spot an animal in a landscape. This is a picture of a milkweed. This is a picture of a plant. This picture happens to have an animal in it but our brains are hardwired to see the animal first. What we're hoping to do today, as we always do, is to get past that animal bias and take a look at the world of plants that surrounds us and the importance of each and every individual plant in the ecosystem, uh, its relation with other plants, its relations with other animals, and its relations with us as well. So we're going to put aside our animal bias just a little bit and look at the plants. This is a photograph of one of our um, more special milkweed species. Uh, this is phase fees, fees milkweed, um, a very rare and endemic milkweed that is only found in Florida. This is one of the species that you could very easily find here at Brooker Creek Preserve. And it's why we have preserve areas to keep these kinds of species safe. So today's presentation on milkweed, the plant, uh, the genus of plants, uh, we'll take a look at, we'll, we'll have a, a 30,000 foot view at the beginning. Uh, the bigger picture of milkweed writ large uh, the family of plants that milkweed belongs to, not just the genus milkweed, but who are its relatives. And then we'll zoom in on what exactly it is that makes a milkweed a milkweed. Then we'll take a look at some of the associates 
um, some of the animals that you can very often, if not always, find around the milkweed plant. And finally, we will take a look at the species that are native and even one that is not native, but very well established in our area. What, and I hope you read it correctly in the plant and the description of today's class. I don't know how to grow these. I don't know. Please don't ask. I mean, ask, but what I'm going to tell you is I don't know. I've never grown them. What I do is I observe them in the wild. I collect information. I read scientific treatises, treatise, um, and understand these plants on a scientific level. If you want to grow them, knock yourself out. If you want to visit them, come see us here at Burger Creek Preserve. So let's get started with what's in a name. Milkweed was named by Linnaeus Asclepius. Asclepius um, Syriaca was the first of the milkweeds that uh, Linnaeus had a go at, named it Syriaca, as if it were from Syria, the common milkweed. Um, and Linnaeus chose to name this genus after uh, this god of medicine, Asclepius, who is depicted uh, very often in this loosely fitting uh, toga with a staff with a coiled snake. And the staff with the coiled snake, symbol of medicine, for some reason, that reason is disputed, can still be found in the emergency services logo. You will see the staff with the coiled snake um, on the side of a Sunstar ambulance, for example. So Asclepius, god of medicine, uh, and the reason being is that this milkweed plant has a long history of use medicinally. And this would have been known to Linnaeus, even though the plants weren't readily available to Linnaeus in Sweden. What was it, uh, what, what was it, is it about this genus that has uh, placed it within the realm, the la very large and deep and broad realm of medicinal plants, has, in, has to do with uh, various components uh, and constituents that are found within the plant's tissues. In particular, this milky substance, this milky sap, uh, giving it its name, milkweed. It's a, it's a, an opaque sap. It's actually a type of latex. And latex is probably not an unfamiliar word to you. And you might even know that latex was originally taken from plants. The rubber tree gave us rubber distilled or manufactured from a natural exudate of the rubber tree, which was and is a latex. Latex is not unique to rubber trees or to milkweed. Latex can be found across the plant world. Latex is a uh, relatively easy substance for plants to synthesize. Plants are very excellent experts at synthesizing, as we know putting things together, creating things, uh, latex being something that has popped up as a creation of various groups of plants independent of one another. So lettuce, culinary lettuce, uh, the name for the plant that we have turned into lettuce is lactuca. For that lacto milk, that milky substance, that milky latex that is found in wild lettuce sap. It's actually an allergen for a lot of people. Rubber tree, uh, the spurges, the euphorbias like poinsettia, poinsettia, you know that has a milky latex sap, uh, and the poppies, uh, you can find latex sap in the group of plants 
that includes the puppies. All of these are unrelated to one another, but all have this latex construct uh, that is also found in milkweeds. One of the uh, um, characteristics of latex is that it's very gummy, very sticky, and it dries into a almost solid rubbery substance. And it is a plant defense against being eaten. Latex is just one of many plant defense mechanisms that work well enough that give plants that produce latex just that little bit more of an edge so that they will survive to adulthood and reproduce. Latex gums up the mouth parts of insects or small animals that might try and chew on the leaves or the stems or even the roots. Latex is exuded and it gums up the mouth of that um, aggressor. Humans have noticed, because humans are always playing with plants, uh, have noticed that this latex and other compounds found within the milkweed, back to milkweed, have certain um, immediate and certain perceived long-term effects on the human body. First and foremost, uh, ingesting that latex sap as a human uh, shows itself to be a quite powerful emetic and purgative. Both of those things mean bleh, make you bleh, make your body respond in a way that tries to get rid of whatever it is that you just ingested. Other uses for this very seemingly powerful concoction that this plant has created, um, having a noticeable effect on the human body, uh, many other applications have been, um, um, many other applications have been employed um, for the sap and other extracts of uh, milkweed through the ages for this long list of complaints. So milkweed has been used to treat this list, um, among others. This is a, certainly not an exhaustive look, but a couple of uh, uh, scholarly articles on traditional uses of Asclepius as a medicinal plant. Laboratory studies um, of just one species have shown in a controlled laboratory environment, uh, these um, uh, peer-reviewed results that there is a shown anti-inflammatory, um, pain-killing, and whatever antipyretic means, these effects have been shown and the experiments have been duplicated and it can be said that Extracts of Asclepius are effective um, against cardiovascular issues, either speeding up or slowing down the heart, swelling or shrinking of the blood vessels, uh, has shown efficacy against microbes. So in certain doses, uh, extracts of Asclepius have been shown to kill germs. Uh, all these have been shown to be effective, effects on these viruses. The one thing that milkweed has not, that has been tested, that has not shown to have worked out um, is as an anti-fertility agent. So cannot use milkweed to sterilize ourselves, even if that's temporary. So. Just an interesting little side note on modern uses. Uh, perhaps the most profound of the uh, medical applications are down to the suite of compounds that are created by, synthesized by this genus and some of its kin, several of its kin, 
this group of chemicals that are referred to as cardiac glycosides. That means they have a profound measurable effect on the heart and its proper functioning. Uh, the most famous synthesizer of a naturally derived cardiac glycoside is the foxglove. Um, digoxin, uh, named after the genus of the foxglove digitalis, you might know someone who has been prescribed a derivative of this plant. So again, um, this is a plant defensive chemical. Um, this is meant to have an effect on an aggressor. This, these cardiac glycosides are meant to act as a deterrent. Humans have found that in certain doses, that deterrent quality can be applied to symptoms and used medicinally. So quite an interesting little side note about our milkweed friends. So milkweed is sitting there making these toxins, these poisons, um, in order to not be eaten. That's the end result of putting energy and effort into creating these toxins is to prevent being preyed upon becomes a paradox when plants are producing a lethal substance and the very predator that these substances are meant to work against turn to relishing that very deterrent and using it, stealing it, usurping it for their own needs, which is what our friends the monarchs do. The monarchs take this lethal plant defense and make it their own. They bypass, they have, they have taken a step ahead of milkweed in the arms race against, you know, predator and prey. Prey species comes up with a toxin against the predator, predator evolves and takes a step in front of it, does it one better and takes that defense and makes it its own. We get into a lot of plant defense mechanisms and poisons in a particular uh, recorded webinar called Plant Poison. If you navigate to uh, UF, IFAS, UF, IFAS, Extension, Pinellas County, you can spend another dreary wet Wednesday afternoon perhaps learning about plant poison. So that's how Asclepius got its name. It's medicinal, it's wrapped up in its medicinal lore, and it's even named after this god of medicine. So who are related? Where does Asclepius fit within the world of flowering plants? Who are its people, so to speak? Let's look at some of the plants that it milkweed is related to. Well, the family that includes milkweed is called the Apocynaceae. And Apocynaceae gets its moniker from the genus Apocynum, which means hurts a dog. Literally translated, Apocynum means get rid of the dog. Um, this is a North American plant a small, unassuming kind of prairie plant, roadside plant, doesn't come as far south as Pinellas County, uh, scattered populations in the Panhandle, but pretty well known east of the Mississippi River, spreading dog bane. Its English name is a literal translation of its genus name, Apocynum. The Apocynaceae also includes um, oleander, so these are plants that share a common ancestor and live in the same family and are related to one another. Dogbane is a dogbane because it produces these cardiac glycosides. Someone noticed that a dog got a mouthful of it? Didn't end well. You might be aware that oleander also has certain toxic 
capabilities. When I was growing up here in Pinellas County, I don't know if it was a, I don't remember quite how the story went. It doesn't matter because it was just a story about the family that was cooking hot dogs around a campfire and they used oleander branches and they all died. You know, we all heard stories like this based in a, you know, kernel of truth that yes, oleander does contain poison compounds that it produces for its own defense. If you've ever grown wax plant or if you've ever seen a wax plant, perhaps if you noticed very closely, and if you've ever considered a milkweed flower very closely as well, you can see the familial resemblance between the wax plant and the milkweed in the same family, different genus, but they all have this common ancestor that places them in the same family. Looking a little bit different than its relatives, the golden trumpet is a member of this family as well. Alamanda cathartica, named cathartica. Do you know what a catharsis is? In this application, it means makes you vomit. So Alamanda, the Alamanda that makes you vomit um, because again of these compounds that the plant symp sympathize, synthesize. The Madagascar periwinkle is another member of this group. Perhaps you've noticed that this plant also can have a slightly milky latex sap. It also produces compounds that have been used medicinally against using the toxins synthesized by this plant to antagonize something else. Uh, Vincristine is an extract of Madagascar periwinkle that has been a game changer in the treatment of childhood leukemia. So a real success story there, a member of this apostanaceae. If anyone grows frangipani, you might be again aware of that milky latex. Not all the members of this group produce latex, but it is something that is quite common within this family. It arose within this family and many of the genera within the family um, have that characteristic of creating this latex and certain toxins as well. And the desert rose, now that you've seen these side by side, perhaps you can see the familiarity amongst several of them. The desert rose flower looking very much on close inspection, uh, for instance, like that uh, oleander flower. Once the flowers of any of these uh, different genera are pollinated and the fruit sets the fruit of this family is characteristic as well. It is a dry, elongated capsule that splits open when it's ripe. So it's not a juicy fruit, it's a dried fruit. That, it's a dried seed pod that splits open to release seeds that are very often ornamented with these parachute um, type structures that help get the seed away from the parent plant. This is the seed pod, the fruit of the desert rose, showing those characteristic bristles. So there's milkweed in context. What makes milkweed milkweed? Of all these different species of milkweed, what, what is it that, that hangs them together? Well, it comes down to their unique flower. Their unique flower not that the other members of the family don't have unique flowers, but in the case of milkweed, here are some of the characteristics that make milkweed milkweed. Kind of a complicated petal structure. They have extensions, lobed extensions of each petal, modified into a structure that is called a corona. Only a handful of flowering plants have such complicated um, petal structures, structures that are modified into this thing called a corona. A daffodil has a corona, you know, the tube that sticks out of the middle of a daffodil, that's an example of a corona, not related to milkweed, but milkweed also has this kind of extended uh, petals that has this attachment called the corona. 
In side view, you can see the corona kind of stands up and away from uh, the center of the flower, creating this cylindrical center to the flower. Uh, cylindrical, um, solid, table-like structure with these horns that stick up. It's between the complex shape and the waxy texture, the waxy slippery texture of the flower. Basically what milkweed is doing is setting up an obstacle course for any potential pollinator to slip around on uh, whilst trying to uh, fish for nectar or probe for nectar, probably a better word. In addition, these flowers don't produce loose pollen like most other flowers do that you've seen covering bees, uh, being very messy, being very easily transferred as a dust. In the case of milkweed, the pollen is contained in discreet little bags, little saddle bags. And this is a picture on the right, a drawing of one of these structures that's called pollinia. And you can see the individual pollen grains inside the bags on this little horseshoe shape that actually attaches itself to the legs of the visiting pollinator unawares. Looking down on a milkweed flower, we can see this tableau, this slippery, waxy surface, and in between each of the petals is where that pollinia is very lightly attached. So a stumbling pollinator walking around on the surface of a milkweed flower is inevitably going to have a leg slip down into these little slits and inevitably pick up that pollinia on its legs through a series of adhesive pads or just the V shape of this pollinia structure itself clamping on to the visiting pollinator's leg. So the pollinator is collecting nectar minding its own business, losing its footing on that waxy flower surface, slipping down and picking up these little bags of pollen that are then transferred to another plant. Here we have a bee, honeybee, clambering around on a species of milkweed. You can see that kind of complicated corona structure, coronal structure with the pollinia located in between the individual petals and they are being stuck to the bee's leg. Doesn't do any harm, doesn't prevent the bee from flying. It wouldn't be in the plant's interest to harm the insect that is carrying the pollen. The idea is to get that pollen to another flower. So it's just a temporary little uber lift from one flower to another. Not just the bees, anything. Um, Asclepius is non-discriminatory when it comes to attaching its pollinia. Anything that loses its footing is going to get pollinia stuck, hoping that whatever visited these flowers is going to get uh, such a rewarding nectar um, gift that it is going to seek a flower of the same shape, color, height, smell, everything, that it will be transferring pollen to the same species. Here we have a flower beetle. And you can just see, if you look closely, little pollinia stuck to his little back leg there. So the pollen for milkweed is moved by insects uh, by sending pollinia uh, on the legs of the messengers with a nectar reward in exchange. The resulting fruit of a milkweed is not unlike many members of the family, not just the genus, but remember the family makes the dried seed pod that splits open when it's time to, sh to, to shed the ripened seeds. Uh, here is the 
common milkweed seed pod, um, kind of armed with slightly spiny structures. This is after the flower has been pollinated, the fruit develops, and this is the fruit that will eventually dry and split open with the fuzzy seeds inside. People can't help themselves, so they take these things and they make them into souvenirs. Here we have milkweed parrots, whatever, it's a thing. Um, in real life, once the fruit is ripened and mature, it splits open along one seam and releases the ripened seeds out to fly, land, germinate, and grow into the next generation of milkweed. That milkweed down or milkweed fluff is very, very lightweight. Um, it's one of the... Um, uh, one of the fibers that plants are so wonderful at making uh, because plants are such great uh, synthesizers of the carbohydrates. This is one of the starches like cotton, um, like silk floss, uh, lots of plant fibers. Uh, here we have those fibers being attached to the ripe seed to get them far away from the parent plant. Each one of the seeds, of course, containing the embryo that's going to grow into another plant. The idea of plant of seed dispersal, again, not unique to the milkweeds. All seed plants want to get all plants in general want to get their offspring as far away as possible. They don't want to compete with their offspring. They don't want to see their offspring. They don't want their offspring meddling in their business, any future reproductive efforts, anything like that get the offspring as far away as possible. Milkweed uses this fluff. What about if we took the fluff and made it a commercially viable product, like a down alternative? And what if we grew hundreds of acres of milkweed to do it. So we'll grow hundreds of acres of milkweed, feeding all those monarch butterflies. We'll collect all this wonderful uh, down alternative and we'll make a very wonderful insulated um, coat with no, you know, with no down, no animal products whatsoever. Fantastic idea. Absolutely earth-changing, earth-shaking, earth-shattering. Makes all the warm and fuzzies. It didn't work, sadly. There was not, we're not there yet. Let's not say it was a bad idea. Let's say this idea needs a little bit of tweaking. These kids tried it. Things didn't quite work out. It's not over. Um, it still sounds very promising and Hopefully, we can figure out how to make this natural product with the benefit of replacing a lot of milkweed that has been that has lost its habitat uh, for the benefit of arguably America's favorite insect. The common milkweed again is the one that has the largest distribution in the United States. We don't have it here in Pinellas County. I am not even sure if there are any of our panhandle counties where this occurs naturally. I'm sure it could be planted and grown in our temperate areas, but down here in the peninsular um, section, it's, it's not at home, we'll put it that way. It's called Asclepius syriaca, which we mentioned before, as if it were from Syria, but poor old Linnaeus was confused. Uh, it is in fact a North American native, as are most species of milkweed. Milkweed certainly has its uh, most diverse distribution in North America. It is the plant that the monarch feeds on the most because it is the most widely distributed. It's hand in hand. Um, the common milkweed 
covers more acreage naturally. So naturally, the monarch butterfly is going to feed on it the most. Um, it is not the most toxic. It does not have the most um, of those cardiac glycosides that the monarch caterpillars depend on and the adults as well to make themselves unpalatable. But it is the one where the majority of the monarchs get their toxins just because there's the most of it. Is everyone okay? I'm going to have a quick drink of water and have a look at the questions. David has a good question about migration. Um, and I know this will come up later um, when we talk about the tropical milkweed and growing the tropical milkweed, which continues to produce leaves and flowers year round, uh, doesn't that screw up the monarch migration? Well, for us here in Pinellas County, we can be safe and satisfied in that nothing that we do is going to have a positive or negative effect on the migration of monarchs because they don't. Florida is a nice little cul-de-sac for Florida monarchs. They may, they may go up and down the state, they may circle the state, uh, but they don't make the huge migration that we see from the central and northern U.S. down into Mexico and back. Our individuals are not a part of that, so it doesn't really matter what we grow in that respect. So if you want to grow any milkweed at all, knock yourself out. You're not, well, you're not going to be interfering in that aspect of monarch biology. What are monarch caterpillar predators? Well, there are predators of, oh, the caterpillars? That's an excellent question. I know that there are birds and certain rodents that can eat monarch adults. And the um, biomagnified cardiac glycosides, that um, built-up toxin, doesn't have enough of a deleterious effect to make it not worth eating. So they're not completely, the adults I know are not completely without their uh, predators. Um, as far as the monarch caterpillar predators, nothing, nothing is jumping into my brain um, right now. Perhaps we need to do a whole hour on monarchs. That might be better. Let's turn our attention back to the milkweed and have a look at what are the associates around this plant? So we have the mon we have sorry monarchs. We have the milkweed species. We know they're producing these toxins to prevent being eaten. We know they produce delicious nectar to facilitate um, the transfer of its pollen that it tricks its pollinators into wearing from one flower to the next. So the milkweed is working really hard, trying not to be eaten trying to make sure that its pollen gets from one place to the other in, the, in a very uh, effective way. So what are the animals that surround this plant? Well, if you, grew, if you do grow milkweed or any of its relatives, the oleander, the wax plant, the um, yellow alamanda, the uh, Madagascar periwinkle, you have probably seen these black and orange aphids, because these oleander aphids are associated with this family. They are immune to the cardiac glycosides. They can also tolerate and biomagnify the cardiac glycosides in their bodies for their own defense, and they can use them in their own defense. And they advertise the fact that they have done this by having these bold black and orange colors. The oleander aphid is believed to be native to the Mediterranean where oleander was brought from. And so this insect kind of hitched a ride to the new world 
uh, on the oleander, found all these native milkweeds and just said, thanks. Our native ant species learned to farm this introduced species, affords them some level of protection and take extra um, sap, non-toxic sap that has been filtered through the aphid body. The ants take that uh, honeydew away, uh, the waste honeydew, take that from the aphids in exchange for defending them from being carried away by any potential predators. So quite a lot of biology going on your little milkweed pod. There are other insects that have found a way to make a living associated with milkweed, and one is this red milkweed beetle. Again, Peninsular Florida is a little bit too far south for this species, uh, but visiting friends and relatives up east, if you will, and visiting one of the many species of milkweed, you might find these bright red and black beetles associated with the plants. This beetle is a uh, herbivore. It does eat the leaves of the milkweed. The milkweed is trying to prevent this from happening by making this latex that when dry will gum up the mouth of this predator, this herbivore, so the milkweed beetle tries to outwit the plant. So it's all this back and forth and back and forth. The milkweed beetle goes downstream from the flow of the latex within the plant vascular system and cuts through a major leaf vein, causing that leaf to bleed the latex out. That's what's happening in this photograph. Beneath this beetle's head are his very strong mandibles and he's cut through that center vein and the latex is leaking out. What the beetle will now do is go ahead of this flow, walk towards the tip of the leaf, go ahead of the flow, where there's going to be less concentrated latex and less concentrated cardiac glycosides and it's going to feed on the tip of the leaf and will continue doing this across the plant until it's reached a suitable age for reproducing then it's going to teach its offspring to do the same thing another beetle associated with milkweed this is a bad picture that we took here at brooker of the swamp milkweed leaf beetle uh, again does derive some of those toxins from eating flowers and eating leaves and sequesters some of those toxins, tolerates a level of toxins and sequesters some of the toxins and advertises the fact that it's got them inside by being black and red. Really does seem to be, or black and orange, whatever, you, however you want to describe that color uh, that's found throughout these associates of the milkweed. The large milkweed bug, perhaps you've seen this one, not related, it's not a beetle, it's um, an actual bug, a true bug. Uh, the hemipterans have this kind of classic diamond shaped body. These are seed eaters. These have very long probing mouths that can get through the wall of the milkweed seed pod and they can feed on the nutrient that is reserved actually for the milkweed embryos, so it steals that away. It is um, a disfiguring animal to have if you're trying to cultivate these plants. It's not going to kill the plant. It is going to have an effect on the reproductive capacity of this individual plant or that seed pod this year, but it's not going to kill the plant. It wouldn't be in this species best interest. You can see all different ages feeding on the seed pod of this milkweed right here. And again, having that aposematic, aposematic coloration. Aposematism, having this bright coloration that suggests toxicity. So we've seen it in the bugs, we've seen it in the beetles, 
and we see it in the monarch butterfly itself. These warning colors that suggest just don't, just don't even try. I'm warning you. Um, this coloration is not just found in those species. Other associates with this kind of coloration include this tussock caterpillar. The tussock caterpillars, very hairy caterpillars. Of course, they don't want to be petted. You might know that from experience. These hairs can contain um, very abrasive bristle tips that can break off and irritate skin. Um, this caterpillar, the milkweed tussock caterpillar, feeds on dying leaves. So the concentration of those defensive toxins is reduced in leaves that are on the way out, but still enough for the caterpillar to be able to tolerate and yet derive some of its own defense from having consumed. So late in the year, you may see the tussock caterpillars cleaning up the old dying and uh, senescing leaves of a milkweed. Interestingly, the adult of this caterpillar is a moth. And this moth not only has that coloration as a warning, but this moth takes it one step further and it actually uses acoustics to scare off potential predators. It makes a noise. So at night, if this moth is flying around and no one's noticing his warning colors, this moth takes it a little step further and makes noise, which is a called acoustic apocimatism. So come join us for a moth night at the end of the month. We'll talk more about that. Let's finish up with what species we have here in our county. Now, in Florida, we have about 22 different species of milkweed, which is great. Um, some are more temperate, which you would visit more in the panhandle area of our state. And as you go further north, as you move further down into the peninsula, we get less and less diversity of species. So there's only 10 naturally occurring in Pinellas, but perhaps that's a good place to start with the species that are easy enough to find in our county. We'll start with the one that's everywhere, uh, the scarlet milkweed or the tropical milkweed. Now this one is not native, but this is the one that is very widely grown intentionally and not because this is a plant that has begun showing up in our natural areas uninvited. Remember the seeds are attached to those plumes. So the seeds of this milkweed can find themselves into natural areas and become established. There's a lot of thought and discussion and opinion surrounding this plant. Uh, it is grown commercially because it has a lot of qualities that make it a desirable landscape plant. It's relatively problem free. It doesn't need a lot of water or care or pesticide or herbicide. It flowers year round. It regrows after being completely stripped of its foliage and flowers by hungry monarch caterpillars. It is attractive and is a food larval food source and a nectar food source for the adults. So this plant does have a lot going for it. Um, some of the negative connotations that are ascribed to this plant are the fact that it, it interrupts what could be a very natural cycle of our resident monarch species where they are encouraged to continue feeding and reproducing and laying eggs and pupating and you know, the life cycle never stops year round because there's a constant continual year round food source. Um, there are arguments for and against that. Uh, we did mention already that um, our resident monarchs aren't 
migrating. So the presence or absence of this plant isn't really going to affect migration because it's not really a thing. Um, certain of these plants are grown in um, greenhouses where uh, herbs, uh, sorry, pesticides are used uh, to prevent infestations by say that aphid or those bugs or those beetles and those uh, pesticides might be transferred once you bring it home and might have a negative effect on something taking nectar or feeding on the leaves. So this plant probably should come with a caution label. At least think about this if it's something that you want to cultivate on your own. The species that you need to come and visit are the ones that aren't quite as easy to grow from what I understand. And it's why they're not available um, because they can't be mass produced very easily or displayed in a nursery on a shelving system in the parking lot at your big box store. These are the species that are a little bit more selective as to where they grow. This species is endemic to Florida. It is endangered because of habitat loss. Um, has evolved in very, very dry, very, very well-drained scrub-like conditions. Not the kind of conditions that the average homeowner, unfortunately, in our state is going to provide. One that is burned and dry and um, arguably unkempt. That's just exactly where this milkweed would love to grow and it's exactly where our native monarchs would expect to find milkweed. You can just make out the leaves of the species very long and linear so as not to lose very much water. It's a small plant, low growing, flowers once a year in the spring. You can see the little pollinia, those little horseshoe shaped pollinia ready to leap onto the foot of a visiting pollinator. This one would be quite happy if no monarch eggs were laid on its very thin, narrow leaves. Contrast that with this huge hulk of a milkweed, the Sandhills milkweed. Um, big, fleshy leaves, lots of surface area. Um, this one grows fast and furious and produces quite a lot of biomass loads of fruit, loads of seeds, and then it's almost as though it is resigned to the fact that the caterpillars are going to take all those giant leaves away and the sun, the drought, and everything else. So usually at the time of the shedding of the seeds, this plant is just a dried up husk of what it once was, but it has an underground storage root, a tap root, where it has lots and lots of stored energy to push through and go through the cycle again the following year. Also a good way to get out of the way of summer wildfires that might be lightning struck. So here's a plant that is perfectly adapted to our flatwoods, our sand hills habitats. Lots of very quick lush growth in the spring and then kind of getting out of the way uh, for lightning season, for fire season. The few flowered milkweed looks very much like the tropical milkweed. And when I first met this species, it fooled me. I thought I was looking at a seedling of the tropical milkweed that had found itself into a natural area. But the habitat was wrong. This is a plant of the swamp. This plant loves to grow as almost an aquatic in such marshy areas as to preclude the tropical from really getting established or being able to compete with those around it. This species though is perfectly adapted to having its feet in the water. Very long slender stems to blend in with and compete with very, very tall grasses, marsh grasses and sedges and rushes and cattails so it can compete with them for height, putting its flowers well within the range, presenting them to any pollinator, anyone who wants the 
nectar are more than welcome to come and visit this flower. It's going to put those shackles on the feet. That's all this plant is interested in. If the monarch doesn't find the leaves, this plant could care less. One species that I haven't been able to locate in the preserve is the long leaf milkweed. And these common names and sometimes the scientific names are given at a moment in time. And since this plant was discovered um, by Western science, um, there are certainly other species with longer leaves, but this one got to get the common name. Fair enough. It has longish leaves, a small kind of violet purple flowers, same pollination syndrome, same reproductive syndrome. It's still a milkweed. It's still an Asclepius. I'm pretty sure this is another one of the species that are more likely found in marshy than dry areas. The Savannah milkweed, on the other hand, is of the pine flatwoods. So seasonally flooded, seasonally dry, often burned. Um, this is an actual photo. This is an actual photo. This photo was taken in an area that had a fire within 365 days of this picture being taken. So not long after a fire came through and cleaned house, the seeds or the dormant buds of this species were stimulated and told the coast is clear. If you get up and flower now, you're going to have access to all the pollinators because everything else is burnt. So, and this plant did not disappoint. This milkweed is pollinated by mosquitoes. Yes, mosquitoes are actually nectivorous for their own needs. For their own adult needs, mosquitoes feed on nectar. And this is a plant that provides nectar to mosquitoes. They get their long mosquito legs stuck in between the petals, very elongated corona, coronal extension of the petals. And you can often find mosquito legs broken off uh, in between the petals of this. So it's a little bit of justice there, a little bit of haha -ha if you're walking through the woods with a friend. Um, the velvety milkweed, tomentosa, this is a, a, a very, another one of the more robust plants. This is about a meter tall, a meter and a half tall, large clusters of creamy white flowers, um, a plant of um, kind of an ecotone area between the pine flatwoods and the oak hammock. So where it's not too dry, not too wet, not too sunny, not too shady, kind of Goldilocks situation. Um, and this plant thrives and does just fine. As long as I'm not around because I have a habit of breaking this one. Every time I see it, I, I'll, I might, it, it just breaks. Anyway, don't want to keep it too long. Butterfly weed is a milkweed that isn't called milkweed. Interestingly, it's one that doesn't have a milky sap. Uh, the butterfly weed, probably why it doesn't get to be called a milkweed. It's still Asclepius. It happens not to produce a copious amount of latex, um, just happens not to. Asclepius tuberosa, have seen this species here in Pinellas, is much more widely grown further north. This is the butterfly weed or butterfly flower uh, that is cultivated in gardens as an ornamental. Um, monarchs are no monarchs, caterpillars no caterpillars, no matter what, it just happens to be a very attractive garden plant. Tuberosa, named for its very robust taproot. Pleurisy root is another common name for this plant, uh, which reckons to its applications as a medicinal plant by early Americans. Pleurisy being an, um, an affliction of the heart, especially the lining of the heart. Bright orange flowers, being Asclepius, it has, of course, the same pollination syndrome, the pollinia, everything else, the corona. You see the family resemblance there. And we'll finish up with a couple of, these are not Asclepius, but they're still in the family. 
and they're just kind of funny. Um, the balloon plant, which has the shizocarp or the fruit that splits open with the seeds inside, uh, exaggerated into these kind of uh, comedy hollow uh, spheres with the seeds kind of rattling around inside. The idea that these these seed spheres will drop and roll away. This is an African plant. This is not native to North America. Uh, but the monarchs, apparently the monarch caterpillars will enjoy this plant as a larval food plant and the flowers will be visited by any pollinator that happens around. So just as a comedy plant, hasn't shown any signs of being an invasive or anything like that. Just kind of a, you know, I'll say it again, a comedy plant to have in the garden. The giant milkweed, you can visit specimens of this at the Florida Botanical Garden, takes up quite a lot of real estate. Very handsome um, uh, Asclepius-like flowers. This one's very closely related to the genus Asclepius. You can tell because of the flower shape, configuration, pollination syndrome, but being an African plant, um, and being isolated for long enough, this one is considered a separate genus. Uh, the giant milkweed, probably eight feet by 10 feet. So a very, very large, the leaves are silvery. Uh, the, the flowers are bluish violet. Um, I do know someone who um, kind of cultivates monarchs on an in almost industrial scale, and she will rub the hairs off of the calotropus leaves to feed to her young caterpillars, which it's like pre-chewing your cat's food. I just, you know, it, it takes quite a lot of love uh, to do that kind of thing. Anyway, member of the family, interesting, not native, maybe worth a visit at the Botanic Garden or so. I'm gonna take a drink look at some questions, and we also have a quick poll to launch for you all, asking you a few questions, because we are always striving to make things better for you. Ursula had a question, where do we find native milkweed in Citrus County or in Marion County? A good way to find this out would be to visit um, any of your local nature centers, just like we have Brooker Creek and Weedon Island here, you know, speak to the local botanist there, or you could um, look up in the iNaturalist application. Uh, oftentimes, you can look you can look for different species in different areas um, based on numbers of observations in a particular area. Uh, we have visitors here at Brooker that say, I saw a lot of reports of X, Y, or Z species were seen here at Brooker, so I came here to see if I could see them myself. So you can certainly use some of those kind of resources. In certain cases, if a plant is rare, endangered, threatened, anything like that, the location data is going to be obscured uh, just to prevent bad people from going and taking them. Um, so you have a couple of options there. Um, you'd love a webinar on monarchs. We'll see if we can arrange for that. Uh, do milkweeds spread only by seed in my area in New Jersey that seem also to spread by their roots? Um, that was Deborah. Uh, the common milkweed, uh, Syriaca, that one is definitely rhizomatous. It forms huge patches. The species that we discussed today, our native species here in Pinellas, those 11, um, those are not rhizomatous or stoloniferous. They don't increase that way. But that um, a few of the more northerly species, including the common milkweed, they are, it's what gives them their name weed because of the fact that they can be quite aggressive natives. They have a lot of competition. Um, so the answer to your question is no, they do not only spread by seeds. 
cancel that. I have a couple of milkweed plants for sale. How do I keep the monarchs off so they don't eat my plants in a non-harmful way? Interesting question. Um, again, if we do a thing on monarchs, we'll talk about what their eggs look like, how to recognize them, maybe how to relocate them. Uh, but just quickly, um, if you want to save your milkweeds, learn to identify uh, the seeds of those insects that have evolved the ability to eat them and either rub out, destroy the egg or relocate the egg, something like that. But you would probably have to take the entire leaf, not just the, the egg itself. Insects tend to adhere their eggs to the surfaces where they want them to live. Are tussock caterpillars a good thing? What do they become? I think Wendy, you might have typed that question before we showed the slide of the tussock moth um, that was able to make the noise. Kind of a gray moth, but it's got the cool uh, black and black and red striped abdomen. Uh, they're not a good thing or a bad thing. They're just a thing. Uh, they're just kind of a cool thing. What is the favorite milkweed for the state's butterfly and will it grow in central Florida? Our state's butterfly is the zebra longwing. And if it visits milkweed, it's not discriminatory. It would just visit any flower that has the promise of nectar. State butterfly, the zebra longwing, also likes to eat pollen. It makes it live longer. And since milkweed doesn't have loose pollen, it might not have a favorite because it doesn't have everything that it likes. I'm not quite sure. We'll have to go backwards. Um, not quite sure. Um, I have enjoyed my tropical milkweed. I try to control its spread by removing the pods before they go to seed. Is that okay? Um, Carol is asking if it's okay to prevent the spread of the tropical milkweed by preventing it from going to seed. That is a very valid way to prevent the spread of anything. Um, to just stop its seeds from forming, you're preventing it from, quote unquote, escaping from cultivation. Many people do that with their queen palms. They will take the unripe seeds down um, and that prevents anything from eating the ripened fruit and moving those seeds into a natural area. So. Thank you, Carol. That's a very easy thing to do. Um, bearing in mind, and it's probably too late to mention, those cardiac glycosides, the, that, um, that uh, latex um, has shown to be um, uh, quite irritating, especially to the mucous membranes. So if you are emasculating or removing the unripened fruit from your plants, if you do ever get any of the sap of any milkweed on you, don't pick your nose, don't fish around in your mouth, and don't rub your eye. In fact, wash your hands before you do anything if you have ever had milkweed sap on your hands. A couple of milkweed plants, for, okay. I think we've got Plenty of questions. We've come to three o'clock. I need to let you all go. Please do. If I didn't get to your question or if I didn't answer it satisfactorily, don't hesitate to reach out. Jay Stevenson at PinellasCounty.org. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope that we'll see you again next month.